And it's Monday night. And for some reason, the one thing that I thought I had fixed this evening did not work. You just played it. I did. I did just play it. And I don't really You should hum it. I'm just kidding. Hum the theme song. Hum the theme fake song. Fake theme song. Hum the fake theme song. I can't even sing it. I can't even. I don't even know what the words to no no words words are. Whatever, man. It is Monday night and it is time for Dylan Talks Tone. This is what we do. Every Monday night, that really annoys me that we don't have any theme music. I do not understand why that is, but that's okay. We'll deal with it. Uh, But we have Leslie with us this week. And hopefully they can hear me. I believe that they can, and we've got most of all that stuff sorted out. Awesome. Yeah, pretty, pretty sweet. Um, So those of you that are new to our little party that we have every Monday night at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, obviously you are already watching it live on the YouTubes at youtube.com slash Dylan Talks Tone. And uh, if you want to listen to it live, you can go to um, kprlive.com and you can click on the Dylan Talks Tone show link there. Or actually, it's probably just in the live player right now because we're live. So that's pretty cool. And um, yeah, super fun stuff. We got some really cool uh, subjects we're going to talk about tonight. Um, First of all, though, I'd like to have Leslie tell you how you can be a part of the program that we are discussing this evening. So we are also live on youtube.com forward slash Dylan Talks Tone. There is a chat window there. You could chat with us while the live show is going on. I am aka Dylan Talks Tone while we're in the chat, just kind of moderating that and feeding him questions while he talks and does the show. So it is me when you see that name pop up only when we're live any other time on YouTube. It is him. I don't stalk his YouTube. Um, (laughs) So yeah, join us. It makes it more fun for me. Gives me something to do. So yeah, well, and she gets gets to meet all the people that are talking to me all week on YouTube usually. Uh, And those of you that are new to the thing, uh, just so you know, uh, we have like, as of this Uh, recording like 300 videos or so 325 videos or something on YouTube all about guitar tone all about uh, various things that make you sound better and understanding how guitars work understanding not just that um, but over the next few weeks and months we're going to get into a little bit more of the business side of it too because uh, we know that there's a lot of guitar players that are picking up the guitar for the first time or maybe they've been playing for a little bit And uh, they want to make an Instagram video or they want to make a YouTube video. They want to get their music out into the world and start to have other people see it. So not just not just the actual construction of the guitar and how it works, but how the whole thing works, how we can in the 21st century really start to, you know, leave uh, some of our awesomeness behind in the form of music. So very cool. Uh, Let's see a couple of things we're going to talk about tonight. How to clean your guitar. Uh, We're going to talk about a few specific things. A new thing that I tried this week. Lizard Spit sent me some new stuff. And I tried it and it's amazing. So we'll talk about that. And more importantly, we're going to talk about what not to put on your guitar. Because there are things you should not put on your guitar. Ever. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. Because there's a lot of things float around the internet uh, on a daily and weekly basis about that. And we're going to talk about more coil splitting stuff, specifically how Paul Reed Smith does it. This came up as a question in a previous episode because we discussed how we do it here at Dylan Talks Tone. We use that V back there with a demo. Uh, We used a demo, you know, we demoed it with a Kemper and we talked about coil splitting and uneven uh, coil winding and that sort of stuff. Um, And we talked about that. And then somebody brought up the question, um, I thought Paul Reed Smith had a way of doing it. And, you know, so I looked into it. I knew how they did it, but I found actual diagrams. So we'll be able to show you some stuff if you even wanted to try it yourself. However, uh, there's a caveat that goes with it because the way they do it also changes the whole thing, 
how it works. So we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Um, yeah, so we got some got some neat stuff to talk about this week on Dylan Talks Tone. What's going on over there in the chat window land? Well, we had some hellos. We got called out on not having music. Um, somebody asked why I was always attached to a computer. Was I l- watching porn? No. And actually tonight I can see her screen. Oh, that's the other thing. We um, changed the layout. We changed the layout because we got a bunch of requests probably over the last, I don't know, two or three weeks or so. People have been leaving comments on the live show saying the camera's too far away. And so I had to figure out a way to get us both in the shot and, you know, and to get the camera a little bit closer. So it feels, you know, a little bit more like you're sitting here with us because that's really kind of what oh, yeah, I was Somebody liked for. your shoes, too. Liked my shoes. I don't have any shoes on. Exactly. Bare feet, dude. So I have a rule and it's a little early because springtime has come a little early around here. But between like March and September or October, I don't wear like socks ever and i don't wear shoes unless i'm leaving the house in fact today did you, i don't know if y'all follow me personally on facebook but I, I posted a thing that i found at amazon today um and it's those things that you can like stick on the bottom of your feet it's like skateboard grip tape and i'm like hmm, maybe i don't even need to wear shoes anywhere i don't have to wear shoes at all it'd be super fun so anyway uh, back to the music stuff. Um, a couple more things. Let's add to the list. Uh, I, I believe it's 21 years ago this week. Spice World came out. I just want to mention that. <laughs> I've been waiting all day. I saw that this morning about the time I woke up. I've been waiting all day to talk about that. So is that make Spice Girls classic rock? Is it 25 or 20? I think it's like 21. Oh, Almost. Yeah. So I'm going to say we're pushing classic rock status with with That's the Spice so Girls, right? Um, has anybody seen some of the articles on our Facebook page? Also, follow us at Dylan Talks Tone Facebook page. So facebook.com slash Dylan Talks Tone. Um, make sure you follow us there. Um, can you throw the, maybe you can throw that link in the, can you, you can't do links in there, can you? I, I could if I was listening. What did oh, you okay. say? <laughs> uh, Dylan Talks Tone Facebook page. Oh. That was easy. Um, so I want to talk about these these articles that I've been sharing lately. A lot of people have kind of taken them wrong. So first of all, let's talk about this whole Gibson going out of business situation. Um, I actually wasn't going to spend a lot of time on it this weekend or this week. But just before the show, I got in a very good conversation uh, with Jack from uh, Gear Guys Radio and and we were chatting about it and, and um, he showed me a video and it was basically a bunch of guys complaining about how guitars used to be. And this is why Gibson is going out of business. And one of the things Jack said was Gibson buyers are like these people. That's why Gibson is going out of business is basically what he said. Um, plus the mismanagement of everything. Obviously, there's a myriad of reasons why. Um but I posted an article this morning, was it this morning or, or maybe yesterday, about um, how Henry Spankowitz or whatever his name is, I think it's actually just Gowitz. But anyways, um, anyway, Spankowitz made a this whole thing about how he blames retail spaces for not merchandising guitars correctly, not being welcoming enough to players. Um, and my personal opinion is it was a, like a dig on Guitar Center because it sounds a lot like Guitar Center, like everything that he was saying, you know, the guitars, the good ones are too high up on the walls and, you know, that sort of stuff. I actually had a viewer uh, message me the other day saying he like, well, I'm just going to tell you it was my dad. Um, he, he say, well, he's called in on the show. He's got a, he's got a spot here. It's official. Yeah. Um, but he was saying he'll walk out of a store if there's, if he can't access the stuff that he wants to play. And I'm not saying that it's the guitar store's fault. However, if guitar retailers, okay. If guitar retailers 
do not learn from Gibson and other guitar brands who are struggling about how to market in the 21st century and what they should be doing. And they think that the old business model from a hundred years ago is going to work. Number one, they're wrong. And number two, if they don't take notice of it, they might be next. So I'm not saying that it's the guitar center. It's not guitar center's fault. It's not this small retail space's fault. It's not, it's a conglomeration of things. All I'm saying, and even us as guitar players, it's our fault too. Snobby guitar players. We all are because we're tone freaks. That's why we're here, but it can be on us also the way we post on social media, the way we hate on stuff that we're not educated about, all this kind of stuff, it could be on us too. So I'm saying as consumers and as retailers, we really need to keep an eye on what's happening with Gibson because we are all a part of it and it affects all of us. So yeah, it might be Spankowitz's fault, but it affects all of us and the next five years of guitar making and guitar building and guitar sales and guitar playing and all that sort of stuff is going to be affected by whatever happens this summer to Gibson. So just pay attention to it. And when somebody says, you know what? I think we're going to have to change the business model. I think we're going to have to go more online. I think we're going to have to use materials that aren't so exotic. I think we're going to have to use more sustainable materials. I think we're going to have to uh, advertise more on social media and less in magazines. I think we're going to have to do all these things that sound very 21st century because things are changing. Well, guess what? They've already changed. It's already here. And so we should all pay attention and understand how it's going to affect us and like be part of the positive part of that change, right? Like as the next, this summer comes and on into the next model year of guitars, don't just, you know, hate on everything that comes out. Understand that we are in a time of change and how can we embrace the new thing because the new thing is going to be the only thing pretty soon, right? So um, just, just remember that like we're all part of it and we want to be part of this community for a long time. It's just a matter of how we contribute to it. So um, there's my little editorial on that. And I just, I was, I was thinking about it a lot today because so many people are hating on everything that gets posted about. They're like, they're so angry about it. And I just feel like this is a turning point for all of us as players, as retailers, as guitar builders, as everything. And we can be a part of the positive side of it. Just kind of take note and learn from it. So um, I wanted to put a little bit more of a positive spin on it. Right. Because uh, that's, you know, that's how I roll around here. Um, <clears throat> well, let's go ahead and talk about cleaning your guitar because cleaning your guitar is important. Now there's going to be some people that are going to say, and I'm going to just tell you right now. Um, I do use a favorite product line and this product line, the owner of it, uh, likes me and he has given me some stuff. Um, I am not paid. This is not a paid advertisement for this particular product line, but there is a reason why I use it. I've been using it in my, my shop for about two years, and I'm not going to lie. He gave me stuff two years ago that I'm still using. That's how good it is and how long it lasts. So like the same, the, uh, that same bottle. bottle. Yeah. And we're going to grab that bottle here in a minute. We're going to talk about it. Um, but it's very important to understand, um, you know, Leslie and I, obviously, if you guys follow us on social media, music and mascara stuff and all that, we're like, we're kind of kind of food freaks. Um, and you probably know that our our diet is a little different. So we have this is real big habit of reading ingredients. So we read ingredients on everything. Um, the, you know, like your food, like what's in your food. We want to know what's in our food. And if I don't like the sound of what's in my food, I don't eat that food. I get something different. I know a guitar is just a piece of wood and some wire and some stuff, but if you want the thing to last a long time, uh, and you want it to play good, you're going to read ingredients. And, um, so we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about how 
keeping a guitar clean, even though mojo might be a thing for some people, mojo as in finger goo, um, might be a thing for some people. There is a performance aspect to it. Okay. Um, we're going to show you a couple of very specific things tonight, and I'm going to use this PRS uh, as an example. So first of all, let's just talk about the cosmetic part. Cleaning a guitar is cleaning a guitar, right? Um, just getting the funk off of it. Um, you sweat on it, you, you know, all that stuff. But here's the thing about it. Most, there's a lot of nickel in guitars. Um, and nickel corrodes really easy and real, very quickly, actually. Um, that's why your pickup covers look cool. And that's why your bridge looks cool. Chrome doesn't corrode quite as quickly, but it will over time. Brass corrodes. All of that is from the oils and stuff in our hands. So the more stuff we leave on our guitar, the faster the stuff is going to corrode. You've probably seen like old school uh, Telecaster bridges and stuff where the Allen little Allen keys that you use to adjust the screws like are barely usable anymore because they've corroded so poorly. Um, so keeping your guitar clean is really a thing. But... What do you use on your guitar? Leave it in the comments, even if you're watching this in replay or listening to it in replay afterwards. What do you use to clean your guitar? Because a lot of people are gonna say that they use a lot of household products on their guitar. So Pledge and um, Car Wax. Um, let's see, what else do we got? And probably some people are gonna bring it up. See, maybe Windex. Um, Pledge is a big one. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, as, as some comments come through in a few seconds, they're probably going to, they're probably going to blow up with some stuff. Yeah. We're not there yet, but here's the thing. A lot of those household products are, are products you do not want to put on your guitar for various reasons. Um, so let's first talk about actual cleaners. Okay. So Windex is going to have ammonia in it. You don't want to put ammonia on your guitar. You don't want to put alcohol, uh, based stuff on your guitar. Um, and you don't want to put anything with a solvent. I hear of people using naphtha on guitars, and I cannot believe that Is luthiers. That? It's a it's a petroleum solvent, and the reason they think it's okay to use it is because it evaporates like immediately. Like if you put it on your fingers, you ever had something you put on your fingers and it evaporates so quickly that it leaves like a white spot because it evaporates that quickly. Well, the reason it leaves that white spot is because it has just sucked all the moisture out of that part of your finger. And you're going to put that on your fretboard? I don't think so. Uh, so don't use naphtha. Don't use uh, any kind of harsh cleaners like that. So, and, and the reason we bring up household cleaners in general is because when you read ingredients on household cleaners, all of them are going to have a few things. All of them are going to have bleach, alcohol, ammonia, and silicone. Those are probably the four biggest ones that you're going to see across. I mean, we could go in our medicine cabinet right now or like underneath our sink that we use to clean our house. And all that stuff is going to be, those four things are going to be in almost all of those products to some extent. They're going to be like the active ingredient in a lot of that stuff. You don't want to put any of that stuff on your guitar. Uh, so let's go through them. You don't want to put alcohol on your guitar. It sucks the moisture out. You don't want to put any kind of petroleum distillates like um, like lacquer thinner or anything like that. That'll do two things. It'll break down your finish, um, you know, paint thinner, acetone, anything like that. It'll break down your finish. It'll suck the moisture out. Um, it'll damage the wood. And a lot of people will say, well, I have a polyurethane guitar. But if you have a crack, uh, any kind of finish imperfection uh, in your guitar, it's going to find it especially if it's alcohol or some sort of petroleum. So we have some smart people so far. Okay. I mean, or maybe they just already know what to do. Um, yeah. We got water in a towel. Okay. We got baby soap diluted with water in a foamy soap dispenser for bodies and Taylor fretboard oil for the important part. Um, just using a toothbrush for gunk and scrubbing and other tight places. Guitar honey on rosewood and just a damp cloth on other guitars. Right. So a lot of people here are really smart about it already. They're using they're using stuff that's just it's just basically water and 
water and clean it up. And I, and I hear fretboard oil in there as well. We'll get to that in a second. Um, uh, so for those of us that might not be as familiar, uh, one of the biggest things that you don't want to use on your guitar is silicone. Um, cause what you're going to want to probably do is you're going to want to clean up your guitar. Even if you use, you know, normal, just water and a towel, but then you're going to want it to be shiny. So you go out to the garage and you grab your car detailing spray or whatever, and cause it's shiny. So you want it to be shiny. And you put it on your guitar and you think everything's fine. A lot of automotive products. I have a lot of experience with this. I used to run a body shop. And almost every, almost every uh, vehicle wax, especially if it comes in a spray bottle, is silicone based. Silicone is, besides being a boob, is also... <laughs> uh, very it's it's very oily it's almost like a it it is on some level a petroleum product in fact if you have i'll give you an example um of this speaking of boobs if you have one of those mouse pad with the boob on the side of it and you use that thing all the time silicone will actually leach into your hands and then you go to do something and you'll go to paint something or whatever, and you'll get fish eyes in your paint just from that thing. Silicone is so pervasive. Um, I used something. I don't have it in my shop at all. We don't use it in our shop anywhere. Um, but I do have some like consumer-based silicone that I used for something else uh, the other day. And it, then remember, I was trying to clean my glasses. Like the very the next day, I was trying to clean my glasses and it wouldn't come clean. What, silicone never really goes away. All it does is it rubs it rubs to somewhere else. It transfers to somewhere else. Um, it's very difficult to get it off. So if you spray your guitar uh, with some sort of silicone product, it's going to be on there basically forever. So if you ever have to do any kind of repair, if you ever have to glue anything, if you ever have to um, do a finish repair. If you have to, let's say you have to glue your end pin jack back in or your end pin, uh, your strap pin back in, um, anything like that. Anytime you're trying to do anything else, the silicone is going to compromise that because the silicone is so pervasive. The other thing that can happen is, um, anytime there's raw wood, so let's say you have a nick in your guitar and you use a silicone based wax to wax your guitar. That silicone will actually, it's so pervasive that it'll get underneath the finish next to a chip. So your whole guitar is beautiful except for that one time when it fell over that one time. And it's got that one little chip. And you wax your guitar and everything is fine, but silicone can work its way underneath the finish right there at the edge of that chip and you can have problems with that. It can cause delamination. It can cause foggy spots underneath clear. If clear has been cracked, I'll give you an example. Let me grab this guitar. Now this guitar um, does not have this problem, but just by nature of its construction. So it's got uh, some layers of wood here. It's got uh, a couple of different colors. Now see, there's a chip right here on the very corner right there. Even if it was not chipped, sometimes the clear coat, you ever feel the edge of clear coat between two colors? Silicone can get underneath there and delaminate that and then cause this to fog. It'll, it'll, you ever seen a guitar, uh, that other PRS that I had in here that belonged to, uh, James Brown's son had some foggy spots in the back. And that's possible that that was what caused that His stuff got underneath the clear and caused it to delaminate. Silicone can do that. Okay. So what we use instead is this stuff um this is and you guys have probably seen me talk about it before but it's the lizard spit guitar polish and what this is is basically carnuba and water okay and um this bottle you see how far down it is i've had this bottle for two years two little spritzes will do a whole guitar i mean it's it's insanely good stuff um 
So absolutely amazing stuff. And I'm not just saying that to say that. I've literally used it for two years. And uh, I'm extremely, extremely happy with it. Um, hang on. Let me uh, arrange. What's going on over there in comment land while I'm sitting here fighting with this? Nothing. Okay. Everybody's just listening, huh? Planet Waves Shine Spray. Just check and make sure there's no silicone in it. I am not uh, an educated person on all products. Uh, basically, uh, to tell you the truth, I've gotten to the point where I do not look at a brand anymore. I literally turn the bottle around and look at all, look at the ingredients on it. Music Nomad, the guitar one. Music Nomad makes really, really good stuff. I really want to get some of their stuff here and test it, actually. Um, no, Music Nomad makes some some neat stuff. Um, and then the other thing, so let's talk about, so that's looks. Okay. Uh, the other thing is fretboard fretboard is performance fretboard is how the guitar actually plays. Cause that's your interaction with your hand, with the guitar. So keeping, keeping your fretboard clean, uh, is good. So, uh, we use the lizard spit fretboard oil. Don't use naphtha. Don't use chemicals. Don't use that stuff on your, your your fretboard. Now, here is a huge misconception that we hear all the time. You do not use oil on your fretboard, lemon oil or orange oil. This is orange oil. You do not use oil on your fretboard to moisturize it. Water is moisture. Oil is oil. They do not mix. Water and oil do not mix. So, you will not ever moisturize a fretboard by using oil. What you're using the oil for is to clean the fretboard. That's all it's for. It's basically more or less an acceptable solvent um, to clean the fretboard. Now, the other thing that we use, and I do not have a picture of it. I neglected to do it because I was so excited and I ripped the bag apart. Uh, they sent me, Lizard Spit sent me a fretboard a fret polishing kit that consisted of a polishing rag and then these little emery cloths that were impregnated with it looked like fretboard oil and rubbing compound mixed together is basically what it looked like to me there was 24 of them so i think the intention was that you would um use one pad for each fret and you, it would be a kit and you would go and you could polish all the frets on your guitar because most frets have nickel in them, okay? And nickel does uh, corrode just like with your hand sweat and that sort of stuff. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to try these. I'd always use the um, Dunlop little paper stuff. Um, but this stuff, it would it would clean your fretboard and do that all at the same time. It was, I was like, this is amazing. And so he sent me a kit. And I tried it on this PRS because this PRS was really, really bad. The It was really corroded. This is a 1998. This guitar doesn't get much play anymore. The owner that, that owns this guitar has a, a Dylan, so he doesn't play his PRS anymore. And um, <laughs> and so he, he, like I said, he just doesn't play it that often. Um, but check this out. Check this out. I am like so stoked that this worked. On the right is the unfinished fretboard. You can see um, the corrosion on the frets. Obviously, you can see the finger gunk in between. And on the left is like almost mirror polished. It took me about 40 minutes. I took the strings off and I really took my time. Um, and I had the little fret uh, covers, the little fret guards that I used and the, the comes with a polishing rag, all the stuff in there. It took me about 40 minutes. Look at the polish on those frets. And I don't think people realize, and I don't even know that I realized. I mean, I know good frets are the, the foundation of the whole guitar, but even just that little bit of tarnishing that happens over time, just from your oils, from your hands, um, that being gone and having that way, way higher polish, Oh my word, absolutely, uh, completely changed um, how the guitar feels. 
and I put a new set of strings on it. And I was playing it this afternoon. I was like, this is amazing. It makes a huge difference. Um, the guitar, I'm not going to say it plays completely different, but you could tell your level of comfort on the guitar definitely changed having shiny frets. I'm, it was really awesome. Also, 24 of them, I figured out that I got like three frets per little pad. So I could probably do a whole nother guitar um, with the leftovers. And I, I meant to ask him today and I forgot to message Chris and ask him um, from Lizard Spit if he's going to sell just those little foam pads as a separate thing because that would be fantastic because then you'd be like little refills, you know. Um, they're not foam. They're abrasive, like little tiny scotch brights is kind of what they are. But they're not. Don't use a scotch bright. <laughs> um, that'll tear up your frets. But the super, super like way more fine sort of scotch bright sort of little thing, a little little square. And it was impregnated with some stuff. Man, amazing kit. Loved it. Was super stoked. I'm super glad that he sent that to me. Um, I really dig it. So funny. As you're saying that, I wasn't reading the comments. And there was literally a comment. I see a lot of people using steel wool who clean fret on YouTube. Can't be a good idea, can it? All those little shavings come off and get everywhere. Going to be attracted to the pickup. No. And I think you've talked about that before. Um, and then somebody was like, yeah, a lot of misinformation. And somebody said they use steel wool sometimes. The 0000, zero is the type I use. I cover the pickups with green tape. And then they wanted to see what you had to say about that. Um, without being disrespectful to anybody that's ever used steel wool, but don't ever use it on your guitar ever, 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 ever again. The re Here's the reason. You can tape up your pickups all day long, but like you were mentioning, you're using quadruple aught steel wool. That stuff breaks off so fine and so small. And here's what happens. You clean it up and you think you got it all clean, but it's not the, the fact that it got stuck in the pickups. Uh, and you tried, you, you wiped it off and then you thought it was clean. The danger is not in the right now. The danger is in you have this tiny tiny piece of steel that you cannot see basically um because as you were saying you use the finest steel wool you can find and so when it breaks off it's also the <laughs> like the tiniest little piece right and then it gets stuck in your pickup it will get stuck in your pickup and you won't know it and then next year or the year following as you continue to play and you continue to sweat and moisture comes in and out, that little tiny piece of steel is sitting on that coil, corroding, and can cause your pickup to short. I'm not saying that it will happen every time, and I'm not saying that it will ever happen to a guitar that you've used it, used steel wool on it before. However, I have done repairs. I have done rewinds on pickups where you could go in there and it, they didn't use quadruple aught because I could actually see it, but there was fuzz on the pickup and I could, it was rusty fuzz. It, it's, you could tell that the person used it to clean their guitar. So, and maybe that was an extreme, but I, man, I just wouldn't, um, that's why I really like this stuff because it's non-metallic. Um, it also, I like it because it has moisture in it because it's impregnated with stuff so that it doesn't have any fly off, you know, because it's wet basically more or less. So it doesn't have fly off that gets everywhere. Um, I just, I, man, I wouldn't use steel wool that it's just know that if you do it, just know that there is a risk to it and then call me and I'll rewind your pickup for you. <laughs> so everybody no i'm just kidding um <clears throat> yeah that's that's the only thing with that are we caught up on on uh on vehicle de i mean cart I mean, vehicle and car detail ugh. yeah it's all the same to me um there were also conversation about um things that absorb oil linseed oil being used to absorb into wood to keep it protected but not necessarily moist I like that he used the word moist, just saying. That word doesn't creep me out. Uh, does it creep anybody out? That would be a fun sidebar conversation. Anyway, and what about 
a maple fretboard. Somebody uses Jewelers. Wow, you almost hit me in the face. Jewelers Rouge to polish the frets. Um, somebody said a maple fretboard is lacquered. So whatever you can clean lacquer safely with. Is that correct? So uh, maple fretboards do have a typically do have a clear on them. Um, it depends on the guitar manufacturer and it depends on the age of the guitar, what that is. So I would definitely stay away from solvents, um, because solvents, even, even lacquer thinner or any sort of acetone will break down urethane, um, over time. Um, when I used to work in a body shop, we could take a wet, you could take a wet saturated um, rag with lacquer thinner in it, which is acetone, lacquer thinner. It's really almost the same. And lay it on a car that was, which is obviously polyurethane. And over time, over like overnight, for instance, it would get uh, soft and gooey. So um, I, I wouldn't use anything like that on a guitar ever. I just, I, people might think they could get away with it because it's just a flash real quick. However, when you put a liquid on something, it on a wood, especially even on a finished wood, the, the, the surface is porous enough to keep some, right? Even the oils from your hands, um, when you play the guitar, the oils from your hands soak into even urethane. And so, um, it, you, I just, I am really leery of using any kind of chemicals on it because it will over time have an effect. You know, I can't play a guitar with a nitrocellulose lacquer finish on the neck. Um, I can't because my, my, the sweat in my hands, this is really weird. My hands are very easy. The sweat in my hands is very easy on strings. Like it doesn't break down nickel very quickly. Like I, strings last forever for me. But if I play a lacquered neck, like a, a nitrocellulose lacquer neck, it gets soft and gooey and gummy in an hour. So if your hands do that, then chemicals are going to do that as well. So. so back to the whole pickup and the stuff in the pickup. Randy said he put that in the pickup just for you. Nice. Nice. Well, I'm sure I'll see it someday. <laughs> Maybe not. Well, let's talk about, uh, since we have a PRS here, um, and I was going to actually demo it, and then I realized <laughs> that the PRS that I have does not have this feature. Um, it does not have this funky coil split situation. So this comes up from a question that we had a couple weeks ago. Um, we talked about coil splitting in a guitar. Um, oh, before we move on, if you guys want to know anything about anything we talked about, about clean guitars, all the stuff that I use, I will leave links to everything that I can in the description of the YouTube video after it uploads. So you'll be able to see. Uh, all the stuff we talked about and a little bit more. And actually over the next couple of days, we're going to do some specific videos on the YouTube channel about cleaning your guitar. Cause there's some other little details that we'll, we'll add in there because we'll actually be able to show you with camera shots and stuff. So we'll talk about that. So let's talk about coil splitting. So obviously, you know, we've got the center punch humbucker back here in, in our, uh, in our V we demoed that a couple of weeks ago and somebody brought up the question hey, PRS has this circuit that they use. How does it work? What does it do? And does it work well? And I was actually going to demo one for you. I had two PRSs here. One had it, one didn't. But the one that had it actually already went home and I kept the wrong guitar. I was, or I didn't keep the wrong guitar, but I, <laughs> the one yeah. that I have is the wrong one. So he um, didn't send the wrong guitar home with anybody. No, no. It just went home too soon. I, I wanted to keep it around a little longer. Um, I've never had a PRS in the shop. They never break. So, you know, they're amazing for that. They never break. 
And uh, nobody ever wants to mod them because they like how they sound. Like They I, have them for a reason. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah, you know, you buy a PRS, you don't have to put new pickups in it. You don't have to put new pots in it. You don't have to do none of the stuff that you have to do with other guitars. So nobody works on them. Nobody does anything to them. This guitar is in 1998. So I needed to, and the guy that plays it, owns it, uh, gigs out a lot. And he um, played it so much that the end pin uh, was coming out. So I had to fix that. Um, there was a wire broken off in the tone pot and something else. I don't know. I can't remember. Just some, oh, output jack. Just some little maintenance things that we had to do on a 1998 that's been gigged for thousands of hours. So, uh, you know, they, they hold up really good. Anyway, I was kind of excited to talk about it because we, like I said, we just don't see them very often. So let's talk about this, this cool circuit and I'll, I'll show you some diagrams and we'll walk through it. Um, and talk about how it works and what it does. So I'm going to show you the hard part diagram of how the inside of a PRS with this coil split circuit looks. Okay. So we'll throw this up on the screen here and I don't have a pointer, so I can't really point you around. So we'll talk about what we're looking at here on the left. We have our bridge volume control. Okay, and you can see that there's also a volume mod on there. You see that capacitor that goes from one leg to the other. So that means that they've got the like a, a volume cap on there. Um, we'll have to do a whole nother show on that. We're not going to spend any time on that right now. Um, the neck volume, then there's also a volume, not a volume mod on there as well. Now, here's where it gets interesting on the tone pot. There's a push pull. Okay. And See, there is a 0.022 microfarad capacitor that goes from the tone pot to the three-way switch. And then on either side of the, you know how every push pull kind of has like a box on the bottom? On each side of that box, there's a 2.2K resistor and a 1.1K resistor. Okay, so you have a capacitor and two resistors of two differing values there. Okay, that's how that thing works. So now, uh, let's talk about what this does. Basically, when you pull the tone pot on, the, on, a, on a PRS that has this mod, what it's doing is it's basically the way a... Uh, uh, coil split works is it basically shorts one of the coils to ground and shuts it off. That's basically how a coil split works. When you pull the knob, what you're doing is you're taking one of the wires from one of the coils and you're just hooking it to ground. And then that way, uh, it's a short and then therefore the pickup is completely shut off. Now what they've done here, and I'll, I'll go ahead and show you the other diagram. Uh, let's look at the middle there. So the push pull tone pot, okay, in the middle. There's a resistor on either side. This is a better view of it. And here's why that's there. Because instead of shorting the pickup, the, the part of the pickup to ground, it actually puts a resistor in between so it doesn't shut it all the way off. And the neck pickup has one value of resistor and the bridge pickup has another value of resistor. So basically what you have here is you never really have a true coil split. You have a coil split with a little bit coming through. Basically all it's doing is it's basically turning the volume down on one of the coils almost to zero, but it's still leaving it at like one, one and a half. So you don't have a true coil split. It's just turning one down. That's basically what it's doing. But because there, but because when you do that, you lose clarity, right? Because as the, as the resistance goes towards zero, the clarity also goes away they put basically like a, 
that's what that other capacitor is for is like a volume mod it basically to fool you into thinking that the thing sounds fuller than it does so that's basically it um i tell you what i'll throw this up there one more time in case you want to do this and try it and experiment with it um there's been a uh, there's a lot of forums on the internet and stuff that uh, have like try different resistors and all this kind of stuff, like to see what would work better, um, you know, per pickup. But uh, as I leave this up here and kind of let you guys take note of it, maybe uh, if you're watching on your phone or your iPad or something, you can screenshot it um, so you can use it for later. Um, but try it and see what you think um, on your hum your humbucker pickup that you have in your guitar. And maybe maybe it'll work for you. It's an it's a very interesting thing. Basically, all it's doing is just turning the volume down most of the way on one coil. Um, but that means that it's not a true coil split. So that means if you're trying to get strat sounds out of a humbucker, uh, you really won't get that. It'll be something different. So, uh, which it is. The, the coil split PRS sound is a thing, right? It makes that sound and it's that sound for a reason. PRSs are kind of like that. They make that sound. Whatever sound they make is what they make and that's it. So very cool. It's a very cool mod. I just wanted to share it with you all tonight. Um, does anybody chatting about any of that or is that nobody cares? Mm, they were still talking about the last topic because of the delay. Um, oh. Somebody said they really appreciated your explanation and the graphics really helped. Um, and another person said those are really good graphics. Have you posted it anywhere? I have not. That's actually the official. You go to the PRS like customer care thing or whatever. That's theirs. Um, but I will. I can leave links to all that stuff. Or post it or whatever. How does that affect tone? Um, that would be an interesting question to get a little more clarification on. Um, if you could be a little more specific about uh, tone. Like I was saying, because you're just really turning the volume down most of the way on one coil. Um, I, was, I was explaining this to somebody else earlier today. When you... The way a humbucker works, okay, is you have two single coil pickups and you run them out of phase and in series. But when you do that, you cut off some of the frequencies that each of the single coils make. So a humbucker is not simply two single coils running together. They're two single coils running together minus some of each of the individual single coil sounds plus some other ones mixed in there that they make when they go together. Okay. He specifies having the second coil still active and not off. Right. So that's what I'm getting to. I think that's what I was wondering if he was getting to this. So that means that if you turn off one completely, then not only do you have the phase cancellation of the noise that's different, but you also have the single coil sound by itself sounds different than the two single coils do together because of how they interact with each other. So then if you have one that's not all the way off, it will sound different than if it's all the way off because that other one that's trying to work by itself sounds completely different when it's by itself. I, that sounds really stupid. I, it's hard to explain this, but the two coils, there is a, there's more than just noise cancellation that happens when two coils are together uh, in series. There's, there is a tonal change that happens when you put two coils together. Um, in fact, it changes, believe it or not, you can, you can do the same thing with like a strat and you can put the middle and the bridge in series and out of phase, like in series and um, opposite magnetic and electronic phase. 
and it will sound sort of like a humbucker, but it will sound different because the distance between them is different. So there's all these various factors. And so the long and the short of it is that one and seven eighths pickup, or let me say that right, seven eighths of a pickup is going to sound different than half of a pickup. I don't have that right. You know what I mean? When you leave one a little bit on, it's going to change the sound for sure. And it's not and it's not because the extra one it's on. It's because that there are some frequency cancellations that happen because that one's next to that one and it's doing what it's doing. The cool part is it's quieter than having one off. That is a thing. It's not as noisy. Um, it won't be silent, but it will be quieter. So that, that is a thing. That's pretty cool. What else we got over there? Nothing. I think he was just, he said, thank you. That was a good explanation. And sorry, that's what he wanted to know. Okay, <laughs> good. Cause that it's a tough one. I, it's a hard to kind of, it's, it's hard to, to explain something that I could, I could explain it with a graphic, but I don't have a graphic. Maybe I'll make one and we'll, we'll, I'll show you next week. Maybe, um, in fact, I'm going to make a note. I'll show you next week more what I'm talking about. And maybe we'll do just to how humbuckers work, but we'll really dive into, um, that part of it because humbuckers are not just, like I said, they're not just two singles put together. They, they are their own sound for a reason. They change. It changes. Um, and what's really fun about that is because they are not just two singles side by side, they are two singles that talk to each other differently and then interact differently. You can actually change each one a little bit and change the overall tone. Like one of the... Um, how do you want to say superstitions or one of the kind of traditional things that people like clamor onto when they're talking about really traditional PAFs is everybody thinks that a PAF needs to be like 300 wines different on one coil than the other. Really there's, I don't think there's really any basis to that. Um, like, they didn't make them that way on purpose. They didn't have counters back then. So they literally just, you know, like loaded up the bob until it was full and then loaded up the other one until it was full. And then years later, somebody took one apart and they were like, well, this one's got 300 more wines on it than the other one. So that must be the magic. It's not the magic. It was an accident. They took it apart and they figured it out. But there is a thing where let's say you did take 300 or 500 more wines on one coil than the other. It does change the sound. It makes it a little more mid rangey. Um, and you can make even extreme that more. You can say, well, I'm going to put 900 wines more on one than on the other. The problem with that is then you end up with a different sort of phase cancellation and you end up with more noise. So there's, there's things that change when you, when you do all that. But it's a really fun topic and we can talk about it again. I will I can actually find some proper graphics like we found tonight. I think I, I don't know about you, but I, I thought it was easier <laughs> to explain that way. And then you guys could screenshot it or whatever. And then uh, or, you know, after the video is uploaded, you'll be able to go back and, you know, rewind it and find that spot and, you know, use that that part for yourself. So um, hopefully that was more helpful. I want to do more stuff like that more visual stuff. It's fun. So are we covering everything that people think we need to cover tonight? I'm glad they're I'm glad they're enjoying this. Yeah. Different topic. Yeah. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. I was telling her before the show, I said, now that you're sitting next to me, I'd be able to see the screen and be a part of the conversation, but the print is so small. That I can't. So oh, that's because I have it reduced. No, 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 no. You don't have to worry about it. I, my um, eyes are good. Yeah, my eyes are not. So, um, 
Yeah. Uh, well, we have time for maybe one more quick one. It's 9.55, and we're not going to have any outro music. So, you know, maybe we have time for one more quick one, uh, one more quick question. And uh, and then maybe we'll uh, we'll call it a night. I'm pretty excited about and, and actually while while we're waiting on it, go ahead. I don't have anything. Nothing? Okay, I was um, listening. While we're talking about um, waiting on a question, a last minute question. Keep up with us on social media: facebookcom slash Tone, Instagram. Uh, Dylan talks tone um, because we are really trying to share with you kind of on a more real time basis what we're doing in the shop. And my my plan for that or my hope for that is that it will inspire more questions. So I've been showing a lot more stuff in the shop like, um, you know, when we're making pickups, I was pressing some bobbins together today. And we're using Instagram stories and we're using um, Facebook stories and, and that sort of stuff. So if you subscribe to that stuff, it'd be cool because um, it will it will inspire more content. Because if you see what we're doing in the shop or what we're working on, and I'm sharing that with you on a daily basis uh, more regularly, I'm really trying to be better about it, then you might be, oh, I have a question about such and such. And the next thing you know, boom, we got a whole show for you on Monday night or a video on YouTube. That's what I'm really, that's why I want to do that, you know? Right. So quick opinion, good or bad idea, a fat cat for a neck and a Saturday night special on a telly HH. Is that a good or bad idea? I don't know what the Saturday night special is. I'm not familiar with that pickup. What is a telly HH? What's that humbucker, HH? humbucker. Oh, my bad. But the fat cat is a cool pickup. That's a fun. What they do is they take a, a P90 and then they put a blade right next to it. Oh. And then they can, you can turn it on and off so you can have like this weird humbucker with a blade and a P90 next to each other. And then you turn the blade off and then you have a P90. And I'm a huge P90 fan. So that's a really cool idea. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about for the bridge pickup because I've never heard of. The, I, I'm not familiar with it. Um, it might be one of those. You tell me what it is. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. But I. I, yeah, maybe I, they can message you yeah. after the show's <laughs> over. The other thing, funny thing that's happening in the comments is apparently Randy's phone is just adding random words and messages to his comments. So he just sends these crazy, he just said, you may tennis court be right. Like his phone is going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. Well, I appreciate everybody listening tonight. Uh, thank you a whole lot for being a part of this community. Um what do we have? Looks like we had like 20 people uh, listening here. And uh, you may not know this, but we on, on our live show on that's on KPRlive.com on the radio side. Typically, it's about 200 people watching. So you're part of you're part of a cool thing. And I really appreciate everybody and the ones that especially y'all uh, y'all that come and listen every week. I really appreciate you. And I really appreciate the new ones too. everybody that's just now finding us or hearing about what we're doing. Um and I really encourage you more than anything to just uh, shoot us ideas. Um, know that you as the listener and as the watcher of all of our content on YouTube and this stuff and everything else, you guys are the ones that push it. So you come up with the content and all we do is put it together and stick it out there. So I'm bunker with Al Ninko four, by the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. No, that would be very there we cool. Go. We squeeze. That would be very cool. Well, I thank you, everybody, and I hope everybody has a great, great night.